All right, we've covered a lot of information on, over the last series of lessons looking at our 12 lead EKG. All this information is very important in being able to help you to evaluate your patient's 12 lead EKG and to help find any changes that could be signs of various pathologies. One of the most important of these for us to recognize is when our patient is experiencing a lack of oxygen, also known as ischemia and or infarction. We'll take a good look at just that over the next couple of lessons, starting with our introduction to acute myocardial infarction in this lesson here. All right, I welcome you guys back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and my goal with this channel here is to try to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and making them easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that. If I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel below. Uh, make sure you hit that bell icon, though. That way you never miss out when I release a new lesson. Now also, if you do enjoy these lessons and you'd be interested in getting CE credits for following along with them, uh, then head on over to icuadvantage.com forward slash academy and join the ICU Advantage Academy where you can watch all these videos. You'll have access to all the notes, including the new notes that I'm currently working on updating, as well as audio only versions of these lessons. And most importantly, you'll be able to actually earn CE credits for participating in this education. So I've got some great deals going on over there, so make sure and check that out. Now, if you would like to support the channel but really don't have a need for the CEs, or if you just want access to things like the notes, then you might also want to take a look at either the YouTube or Patreon memberships. Again, links to both of those. All that stuff is going to be down in the description below. So as I mentioned, this lesson and the next couple following lessons are more than likely the most important aspects of our 12 lead interpretation. While many of the other findings can certainly be important in diagnosis and treatment of our patients, the identification of ischemia and infarction and the subsequent treatment of such has the potential to save the patient's life. With that in mind, you can understand the importance of being able to recognize these both on our 12 lead and combined with our presenting signs and symptoms. I will do a future lesson more directed at this presentation and our patients as well as our management, but the purpose of this lesson will be on what we are looking for on our 12 leads specifically. The subject around ischemia and infarction really has the potential to be a very complicated and in-depth discussion. Over the next few lessons, this will serve as a good introduction to these subjects, but there's certainly much more information that you can learn if you really choose to by diving deeper into various topics. So let's start off with the basics. And really before we begin, let's make sure that we're on the same page with our discussion of this topic. So this lesson will cover these things and our basic overviews. And the next couple of lessons will look at our actual EKGs and various pathologies that we would see. So when we're discussing ischemia and infarction, what we're referring to is situations in which the heart is not getting the oxygen that it needs to function and survive. All the cells require oxygen to survive, and our myocardial cells are no different. In fact, they have some of the highest demands for oxygen of any cells in our body. When cells begin to exist in a state where there's not enough oxygen to meet the metabolic needs of the cell, the way the cell operates begins to change. Initially, they're gonna switch from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism, which is where that energy production takes place in the absence of oxygen. And remember that this is nowhere near as efficient as aerobic metabolism, and it also produces lactic acid as a result, creating an acidic environment with ineffectual energy production. Now, if this oxygen-deprived situation persists, then the cells will build up these harmful metabolites combined with inadequate energy production and will eventually lead to injury of the cell. If this process continues without reversing the situation that's causing the lack of oxygen, then eventually the cells will die. So we can think of this process from lack of oxygen as something that really takes place along a continuum from a normal state of functioning to ischemia, which is a state of inadequate oxygen delivery for normal functioning, then to injury of the cell and eventually to infarction, which is cell death. As our patient progresses through these stages, we'll have some generally well-defined presentations, both from signs and symptoms standpoint, as well as EKG changes that we'd expect to see which we will be discussing here soon. 
When we look at ischemia and injury, both of these typically will manifest with chest pain, but they are reversible. They are the result from an imbalance between the oxygen being delivered to the heart and the metabolic demands of the heart. So this can result in either or both from an increase in the demand of, of the heart and the oxygen that it needs, or a decrease in the supply of blood and oxygen that's going to the heart. Infarction, since it's the death of a cell, is not reversible and will certainly have permanent impact on our patient, the degree to which will really depend on the extent and severity of this cell death. All right, so now let's take a look at the distribution of blood flow through the myocardium. Understanding this distribution of blood flow is really going to help to understand the shapes of infarctions and how they're going to manifest on EKG. So we had previously discussed the flow of blood through the coronary arteries, which I'll link to the lesson up above if you haven't watched that yet. Now from the main arteries, which are on the epicardium or the surface of the heart, the blood vessels begin to branch and dive into the myocardium. This branching, we can think of a tree-like structure where as they go deeper and get closer to the endocardium, they divide and branch into smaller and smaller vessels, spreading out in an upside-down tree-like presentation. So because of this branching pattern, each big branch ends up perfusing a wedge-shaped section of the myocardium that is going to get wider as we approach the endocardium. Now these wedge-shaped sections end up overlapping like we can see here, which allows for some cross coverage of some of these areas. Now when we have infarction or cell death that takes place, we'll see the cells die in a similar wedge-shaped pattern that gets wider as we approach the endocardium in relation to the branch that is perfusing that area of the heart. Now spreading out from the area of infarct, we also have areas of injury and then ischemia. But these areas spread out with wider areas closer to the epicardium. And this is the result of a few different things. So as I mentioned, we have those overlapping wedge-shaped sections of perfusion, really allowing the other branches to help perfuse some of the distal areas closer to the endocardium that other branches are also perfusing. We can also see oxygen that diffuses directly from the ventricles into myocardial tissue that's closer to the endocardium. And then finally, we have some small blood vessels called the Thebsian veins that may also exist coming straight off the ventricles, which can also help supply blood to these areas. So these factors combine to help provide extra oxygen to the area of the myocardium that's closer to the endocardium, helping to make them less likely to be impacted by ischemia and injury. All right, so now let's talk about the zones of presentation of ischemia, injury, and infarction. What we're going to be doing is taking a quick look at the impacted areas in three different scenarios. So first is going to be ischemia. So this lack of oxygen, as we just discussed, will impact an area of the myocardium that is in a wedge-shaped pattern, with a wider section along the epicardium, as you can see here. This area of ischemia ends up being more negative than the normal myocardial tissue, which leads to ST depression on EKG, Along with that, we also have repolarization that's going to be taking place along an abnormal pathway, giving us inverted T waves there as well. Next, progressing along, if we take a look at injury, we also see a similar wedge-shaped pattern wider near the epicardium, just like with ischemia. A big difference now is this area of injury is not going to repolarize properly or completely, keeping this tissue more positive than normal myocardial tissue. The result of this is ST elevation appearing on our EKG. Again, the repolarization is taking place abnormally, leading to the persistent T wave inversion. And then finally, when we take a look at infarction, this is now myocardial tissue that has died. As a result of the cell death, this tissue is no longer generating any electrical activity. In fact, this area of infarcted tissue actually acts as a quote-unquote window in which electrical activity from the other side of the heart can actually pass through or be viewed through this window. So this can actually present on EKG as electrical activity being picked up that's going away from the electrode, uh, thus negative, and thus produce the negative Q wave. Now this doesn't always happen. Uh, in fact, we can have infarction that doesn't impact the entire length of the myocardium, not giving us this window to see through, and thus uh, not seeing Q waves as well as can also be small enough as to not cause ST elevation, and in fact, ST depression, 
sometimes giving the appearance of ischemia. Now, this discussion is going to be beyond the scope of this lesson in the series, but certainly something for further research if it's something that you desire. So back to our normal infarction, we do see even more ST elevation due to the extent of injured tissue surrounding the infarcted tissue. And again, we continue to see inverted T waves due to the continued abnormal repolarization pathways. All right, so finally for this lesson, I wanted to review over the classes of acute coronary syndrome or ACS. So these conditions cover the continuum of cardiac conditions from ischemia. So I'll probably do a future lesson at some point like I talked about earlier uh, where I'm going to cover this and its management in more in depth. But for now, a basic overview is going to be important here. So we have three main classes of ACS. We have unstable angina, non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, or NSTEMI, and our ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, or STEMI. So let's start off talking about unstable angina. So this is a condition in which the patient is currently experiencing ischemia with chest pain. So this can either be at rest or minimal effort or activity. Um, patients are usually going to present with that chest pain, along with those associated symptoms like shortness of breath, palpitations, diaphoresis, nausea, and or vomiting. Our patient's EKG is either going to look normal or present with ST depression and or T wave inversion. Our cardiac markers such as troponin are actually going to be negative, and we can really think of this as pre-infarction angina, where severe ischemia exists but has not led to cell damage or death. All right, so moving on to NSTEMI. So NSTEMI is, again, a severe ischemic state with those typical signs and symptoms that we just discussed with unstable angina. On EKG, we are going to see ST depression and T-wave inversion. The big difference between NSTEMI and unstable angina is that we have myocardial cell damage, and thus our cardiac markers are going to be elevated. And then finally for STEMI, this is another severe ischemic state with the same presentations that we already mentioned. With STEMI though, we're actually going to see ST segment elevation on EKG. And remember that these ST elevations are going to present in those regions on the EKG that correspond with the areas of injury, along with those reciprocal changes seen in opposite leads. I did discuss this very early on in this series, but as we move forward, we are going to re-hit this again in the future lessons. So a STEMI is typically going to be associated with a coronary occlusion. So this means the patient is going to need emergent intervention to reperfuse the tissue to prevent further damage. All right, so now that we've discussed all that and you have a hopefully a good introduction to the subject of uh, acute myocardial infarction, we can get to the last few lessons in which we're going to take a look at these and their presentation on EKG to hopefully round out your understanding of what to look for when you're reading 12 lead EKGs. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.